This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Ruth chapter 2 this morning in your Bibles, if you would. Ruth chapter number 2. Now, it's been a few weeks since we've been in Ruth with a couple uh, different people speaking and whatnot. But so to bring you back into the story, we are in Ruth chapter 2. Uh, so far in this chapter, as we've looked at it, we will begin in verse 13 this morning. But Naomi has, has uh, given Ruth permission to go to the fields to glean. She has encountered Boaz. Uh, in fact, verse 12 of this chapter, which is where we left off last time, uh, it's it's a Boaz praising Ruth, and it's really kind of the centerpiece of this chapter, and I think you'll see how that fits as we go through the sermon this morning. Uh, it has a almost a chiastic structure as it begins and ends with similar concepts, this whole chapter. Uh, but let's begin reading with verse 13 here this morning, and we'll read through the rest of the chapter, and then we'll dive in here. Ruth chapter 2, starting with verse 13. This is Ruth responding to Boaz's praise and commending her for how she's taken care of Naomi. Starting with verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not be, uh, though I not, uh, be not like unto one of thine handmaids. And Boaz said unto her at, at mealtime, Come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let some fall also some of the handfuls on purpose for her. And leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field unto, until even, and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. Verse 18. And she took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave her, to, gave her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabitess said, he said also unto me, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have eaten all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text of scripture this morning. And as we continue this story, a story of great grace and redemption, but also a story that is leading to the nation of Israel's first good and godly king, and that of David. Lord, we ask that as we look through the nuggets and the characters and the lives of this story here that's recorded for us in your word, may we wring every drop of what you have for us here out of your word, and would your spirit minister to our hearts. Quicken us to understand how we ought to live in, in spite of your goodness and grace as it is seen through the life of Boaz and Ruth in this story. Lord, open our hearts and minds to truth, clear out the distractions as we 
seek to hear from and understand your word. Guard my mouth with what I say and give me direction and in my thoughts this morning. And may your spirit be absolutely free to do what it wants in our hearts and lives here. We ask this in your son. <coughs> Amen. So the book of Ruth, as we've mentioned before several times, is connecting the dots, as it were, between the period of Joshua with the conquest and the period of Judges that followed to the time of the kings. And it's connecting us forward into there being a king. We've talked a little bit about how there's different acts within the book, and you can almost look at the book like a play, in that in Act 1 we're introduced to the characters and their problems, and it's characterized by death and emptiness. And in Act 2, we've what we're in now with Chapter 2, uh, Ruth meets Boaz for the first time in the field, and it's all just kind of happenstance. She just happened to end up there. And the interesting thing with the language there is that when in Hebrew scripture, in Hebrew thought, nothing just happens. Who's the one who dictates and, and rules? It, it's God. In fact, in the language of the Old Testament, most of the things just happening are the Philistines or other nations around. It, they're, they're trying to determine if something's just happenstance or if it's the will of the gods. But in the Hebrew <coughs> writer's mind, he knows this is by God's hand. And so as he tells us, she just happened to end up in the field of Boaz. He's giving us a wink, wink. We know this is not just happenstance. This is God at work behind the scenes. And the question is, how will Boaz, how will this landowner, how will this relative respond? We'll then move to chapter 3, where they will meet again on the threshing floor after the grain is all brought in and harvest. And chapter 4 ends with, the reversal of chapter 1 with family, with blessing, fullness, and a genealogy leading us to David. As we looked at this chapter, we started off with kind of a theme looking at how Ruth is seeking grace. She enters into the field. She goes out to glean, hoping to find someone who would be gracious and allow her to glean. She's trying to find food for her and her mother-in-law in a foreign land. She finds much more than someone willing to, to be food. She finds grace in Boaz. She finds favor in a foreign land. Now, Boaz has already shown much grace, and everything in Boaz's reactions with his workers, the, the way he approaches uh, and deals with Ruth, he it drips with graciousness. Uh, going above and beyond even what the law would prescribe in these various situations. But as we get into it today, not all of Boaz's grace or graciousness or blessing is on the surface. Not all of it will Ruth know about. In fact, he's going to do some things behind the scenes, almost good trickery, if that makes sense, to bless Ruth in ways that she doesn't even see what he's doing. And so uh, I, I titled this section here as we start with verse 13 to the rest of the chapter, Giving More Grace. The chapter does have a, a bit of a flow to it in that it starts at home with Ruth and Naomi. And they're starting over. They're trying to get life together. They're trying to get food. We'll have this larger section where they're in the field with Boaz and finding favor and food. And then it will end with Ruth and Naomi home again and discussion about the day's events. In a more detailed look through the book, we start or this chapter, we started with Boaz being introduced. Boaz starts by blessing his workers in verses 4 to 5. And Ruth is of notice and is raised to question who she is. Ruth has expressed the desire or determination to glean in Boaz's field. He has granted that, and he invited her to drink what the young men have brought. Okay, So he's, he's brought her into to a little bit of privilege here. It moves into then what we dealt with with her response in verse 10, where she's amazed at his grace towards her. And she asks why, which leads to the blessing in verses 11 and 12, where Boaz praises her for being a noble woman, even though she's a Moabite, an outsider, an outcast, one with a checkered past, checkered um, ancestry. He praises her for her support and her taking care of her mother-in-law, Naomi. And, and he recognizes that she has given up the gods of Moab. In fact, throughout this language, he doesn't, acquiesce to her. He doesn't say, you know, may the God of Chemosh bless you, the God of Moabites. He, he brings it back to, may Yahweh, may the Lord God, the God of Israel, bless you. 
And under his wing shalt thou trust. And that language of under his wing ties to several Psalms, but specifically Psalm 91, with God as a protector and shielder under the wing. And it's a beautiful thing because Ruth is an outsider, but she's getting sheltered under the wing of the God of Israel. As we begin into this section here, we're going to now start with Ruth's response. So just like she responded, thanking him for uh, the the ability to drink and to, to get water when she needs it, she's now going to respond to the blessing Boaz has placed upon her, and she's going to be amazed at the grace Boaz shows to her as his maidservant. So that's where we'll pick up here this morning in verse 13. So then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, O my Lord, for thou hast comforted me. For thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. I find it interesting here, as, as she is responding to Boaz's blessing, she's not, how do I say this? She has stepped out into the field. She's put a hard day's work in, or at least part day at this point. She's doing the hard task of providing food, and she's not beating her chest or rubbing, saying, ha, look what I, yes, you, somebody has finally recognized the merit of who I am. Her response is not that at all. Her response is that of humility. Her response is, Boaz has responded with grace. He's shown grace to her, and he's shown favor to her, but she doesn't take this for granted. And, and her response here in verse 13 is, is dripping as well with grace and humility. She's Grateful that he has spoken friendly to her. Remember, this is the time period of the judges. I've brought this up time and time again, but I don't want you to lose the idea. The book of Judges ends with you know hundreds of Benjamite men running out of the woods to capture women. That's how they treat Israelite women. How do you think they treat a foreigner? And so here within the time period of the judges, in the place of the judges, Boaz is like this haven where there are people who fear the Lord. And seek to live in that way. And we don't have all the details, but we're, we're catching this picture of there's something different about Boaz and his workers. And Ruth recognizes and she responds with humility. And so she's not stirred to pride, but she, she's very humble in her response. What's also interesting as I was reading and thinking about this, this could be a dangerous place for Ruth. Now what I mean by that is Boaz is not dangerous. We've read the story, you know the story. Boaz is, is a good, godly man who's going to do the right thing. But if you remember back to the words of Naomi, had Naomi said much to Ruth that was positive? No, in fact, Naomi, when she comes back into town, she says, I have nothing left. All my, ch my children are dead. My husband is gone. I went out full. Now I come back empty. And all that, we could assume, I, I suppose, Ruth heard that. How would you feel in Ruth's shoes? You've just been thrown under the bus. And so if Naomi, and we don't know the conversations behind the scenes, we don't know what's taking place in the house, but as the narrator of the story is, is telling us the story, we don't see any insight that Naomi's been very positive. She wants her name to be called Bitter. She's, she's a grumpy old lady. And now that Ruth has left the home, She's gone out to work, and her first interaction with this landowner has been very positive. If he's a gentleman to take advantage of women, he's, he's really put her in a place where she could be very quick to turn on Naomi. Now, I, I say all that, that's not the drive of the story. Okay, I want to be clear. That's not where the story's going. But there's something that I, I would apply to our own hearts and lives. For those around us who we love about love and care, we tend to be harder on them than anyone else. We let our hair down, we let our emotions on them. And, and sometimes with children, once they find some attention, once they find some verification and just somebody outside of the home, they can walk away from the home. Now, that's not happening here in this text. It was just something the Lord brought to mind as I was studying. So I want to be careful here not to impose that within the text here. But Boaz has been kind to Ruth. Ruth is responding in kind, which is not what we read, at least, of, of what she's experienced at home. The text goes on. Um, she, she says, I am not like unto one of your handmaids. She recognizes her position. Her status is she's not even 
at the level of the, the maids that are working the fields for, with Boaz and his reapers. But she's recognizing how gracious and good Boaz has been to her. In for, verse 14, we go on. And this, this verse is actually um, probably best understood as a transition. There's been a period of time between verse 13 and verse 14. Now, why do you say what I would want to insert a period of time? Well, we have this phrase here. It says, at mealtime. Okay? And Boaz said unto her, at mealtime. So probably what's happened is they've had this interaction. Once Boaz shows up and the, the, he has his conversation with his foreman, he talks to Ruth. They have both been gracious and kind to one another. But then there's a period of time where she's worked, and now it's time to come eat. Now, in that part of the country, part of the world, that your noontime meal is not like us at noon. They tend to eat later, about two or three o'clock. So that was, the, and I, I kind of wonder if that has to do with the heat of the day and things of that nature. But either way, it's at, this verse's setting is at the meal, and he says to her, "Come hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in vinegar." Now, what's going on here? Well, Ruth had probably brought with her some lunch, some bread or whatnot, to, to have lunch in the middle of the day. Now, today we might put our bread in a Ziploc bag or a plastic sack, to, and that plastic will help keep the moisture in, keep it from getting hard. But what happens when you let bread sit out in the sun for several hours, or even in your pocket in the sun? It gets dry, it gets crusty, it gets hard. Um, I, I like the, uh, it, when I learned about how Oregon Trail biscuits were very hard, uh, what do they call it, hard pack, where you could put that biscuit in your pocket and carry it around all day and it wouldn't fall apart. No Pillsbury biscuit would ever make it in my pocket. <laughs> uh, so her bread, whatever it was, whatever she brought to eat, would have been kind of hard and crusty by this point. Uh, she's out working in the field, it's hot. And so he's inviting her in and says, here's, um, eat of, eat of the bread, Possibly he's offering her some of his bread, but dip the morsel in vinegar. Now, vinegar and bread do not sound good to me. Most um, most lexicons on the word vinegar here have vinegar as a translation. However, that word can be very broad. They don't. Look, it can be anywhere from like a hummus to like a, a, a light, like a, a a wine or a juice that you would dip, dip it in. It could refer to possibly anything like olive oil or lard. So we don't really know some sort of sauce, something that is softening this hard bread, something that's making it more palatable. Hence the reason we have condiments in our life, right? There's certain foods that just, they're a little more palatable with some sort of a condiment. So I don't want to change the text here, but some sort of a condiment or sauce. It's something that's making this bread better. Are you seeing how Boaz is doing everything he can just to be gracious and kind to Ruth? It says, and she sat beside the reapers, and he he and he reached her parched corn. So parched corn would be something, it was like a, a prepared meal, whether they cooked it there and, and kind of fried something there, or or whether this was pre-done. But it says here she ate and she was sufficed. Now this is important to pause and think about this because here is a woman who's left her home. She's come home with Naomi. They have nothing. Now, technically, she owns land, right? Naomi it technically is in charge of land. But what has probably happened is when they left for Moab, they left that land in charge of other people. And so the other people who have worked the land, Naomi can't come in now that they have planted. They've done all the work. She can't come in and say, this land's mine. I get the harvest. They have to get the, the reward of that harvest, which is why Naomi and Ruth are in this situation. They need food for the winter. They're poor. They can't have their, their own land is, is still rented out as it were. But Ruth here had no security of the next meal. And here she's found herself at this meal time. She's full. She's satisfied. She's eaten enough. And it says, and left. Well, what seems to be happening here, because the and left can sound a little bit like she, she got up and left, which she did eventually do here, but it sounds like she had leftovers. And we'll know that from later in the passage where she gives some of the leftovers to her mother-in-law. So she's she eats enough that she's sufficed. And, and so not only, this is, this is very odd, 
in Israel at this time. The reason this is odd is because normally rulers, masters, people in charge didn't eat with their workers. In fact, this goes back as far as Genesis. If you remember Joseph, when Joseph brought his brothers in and the, the servants, Joseph didn't eat with the servants. Okay, So there's a distinction here. But Boaz eats with his workers. And he's gone the next level. He now invites this woman, Ruth, this Moabitess. She invite, he invites her in. And he's good to her. He's, he's, he's being gracious and kind. And she's, she has no need, no want. He's sufficed all her needs. Verse 15 to 16 goes on. So, and when she had risen up to glean, okay, so she's now left at this point, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves. Now, I, I was looking at this and I was stopping this. I, I didn't get a good, I didn't get a good answer that resonated with me. Because if I was in Ruth's shoes, this whole let her glean among the sheaves, I would think that Ruth, if there's certain areas of the field off limits, Ruth as a noble lady wouldn't be pushing the bounds. Does that make sense? But there have been times in my life where I don't know what the bounds are. I'm in a new situation. I'm in a different place. I'm in a different culture. I'm, I'm, I've entered into a new work environment, whatever. I don't know what's what we might call kosher or normal. And so, you know, when you enter the break room for the first time and you sit in somebody else's seat, you don't, you don't know that this is the seat that someone else, so-and-so, normally sits in. Okay? It's an unwritten rule. It's, I kind of wonder if that's what's happening here. Where she's, she doesn't necessarily know the areas that are off limits. But Boaz is telling his workers, hey, if she enters into those areas that we normally have off limits for us, don't stop. You know, so it's, I, and looking at it that way, I think Ruth is still a noble character. I'm not trying to demean that. Not that she's perfect. But he's wanting to make sure his workers know, hey, just let her go wherever. Just be nice to her. Just just let her have whatever. He also goes on to say, reproach her not. Now this word, reproach her not, um, really leads people to think some different things about what might be happening. Some some go to the fact that Boaz is concerned the men of the field would either be rough with her or take advantage of her or sexually abuse her in some way. Some are concerned about that. Uh, others think it's just more of a verbal um, disgracing and shaming. In fact, that approach uh, was so is is such an ancient approach. When the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Book of Ruth, when it translated it, it uses a Greek verb that refers to dis disregard or disgrace and shame. So it, it's an old approach to this. So whatever it is, he's being very careful that his workers know don't do anything against this young lady. In fact, don't just withdraw being bad. But then he goes on and says, in verse 16, and let fall also some handfuls of purpose for her. So he's being very positive. Don't just avoid harassing her, but make her work easier. Here we have Boaz Remember, this is behind Ruth's back. Is it ever wrong to go behind someone's back? I'm thinking here, yes it is at times. Uh, maybe not in a bad way. Uh, but here, he's going behind your back, but being a blessing. And I, as, I, as I think of this, you know, there are several books in the Bible. Ruth is one, Esther is another, where we see God doing this. We see God behind the scenes orchestrating things so that his will is done, but he's a blessing to his people. And God is at work behind the scenes in your life and mine. And he has people who are dropping handfuls on purpose for us. And so he's going behind her back, but he's going beyond the call of duty. You see, the Levitical law was, yes, you were supposed to cut corners. Not in a bad way, but a good way. You, you cut the corners of the field, you leave that for the poor. Boaz isn't just leaving that. He's now, oops, here's a handful. Oops, there's a handful. And being a blessing beyond what is the call of duty. As Daniel Block notes in his commentary referring to this, he says, Boaz didn't need a law to define the boundaries of kindness. In fact, we're not dependent on laws to govern how we live. We're governed by, the, by love, the law of love. If Boaz is a man of character, 
who is a man who seeks to imitate the God of Israel, the God who is gracious and kind, the God who provides for his, his people, the God who looks out for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the afflicted. Boaz is imitating that, and he's going beyond what the very letter of the law says. He's being very gracious and kind to Ruth. Verse 17 goes on. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. It is always a challenge to know what these measurements are. So much of a challenge, I have a, a beef with my Bible somewhere. Years ago when I was in college, they had a tool for converting these things. Then they got rid of the tool because they said, well, it's just so inaccurate. It's hard to, people base all their things off this tool, but you know, there's some good discussion and commentary, so... They kind of encourage people to go towards the more modern commentaries that research these weights and measures. Well, then, about ten years later, they come back with the tool again and they charge you for it. It's like, wait a minute, I bought that back there. All that to say, there's a bit of discussion, debate, how much this is. An ephah is somewhere between about five to ten gallons. So think about two, either one to two five-gallon buckets of barley here. So this is a considerable amount of food, um, and barley was the first of the harvest, but it wasn't the premium harvest. Barley required a bit more work in threshing. It didn't yield as much of a product, but this is still a good amount. And so she's, she's got this large amount, and she's gone through the process. Now that she's cut it, she's going to beat it, get, the, get the, the, the edible portion of it out, and so she took it up and went to the city. Now we're moving here to the portion where she's going to see Naomi again. And so, and it says her mother-in-law, when she saw what she had gleaned, she brought forth and gave it to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. Okay, what's going on here? What's So her mother-in-law, she's showing her what she's gleaned, these two, one or two buckets worth of, of barley, but she's also brought the reserve of what she was sufficed. Well, what was she sufficed with? The parched corn or lunch. Okay? So we have this abundance in not just as they have the raw materials of what you cook with, but now you've got the leftovers of a meal for Naomi as well. Um, and this is where the, the lunch leftovers is coming in. Notice Naomi's response in verse 19. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of you. This is not an academic. All right, where did you go today? Okay. No. This is, you can read into her voice here a tone of surprise. Because what does she notice? She says, blessed be he that did take knowledge of you. She recognized Ruth couldn't have got this just on her own good work. Just on her own ability, just on her own reaping. There had to be some blessing here. And she didn't know, Naomi did not know that she, it was Boaz. She didn't know anything that happened that day. Other than, you know, but she sees this and her first response is, wow, God blessed you today. And at this point, Ruth steps in and she says she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. So the author of the story here has shortened it. He just tells us that, okay, Ruth conveys the idea of what's happened in the day to Naomi, but we have this important phrase, the man's name is Boaz. So we're connecting here not just the physical need, but, hey, Boaz, he's this character who has been very gracious. And Naomi's response is to bless the Lord. And it says in the next phrase here, And Naomi, Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left his kindness off to the living and to the dead. Now that's a little interesting. Maybe a little prophetic. Boaz has been kind to Ruth in getting her food. Boaz has been kind to Ruth in letting her eat, giving her privileges, and, and, and has dropping handfuls of purpose. But she doesn't say to the live just to the living. She says to the living and the dead. And how do you be kind to dead people? Okay, it's going to tie into that. It's <coughs> it's being kind to the survivors <coughs> of the next generation. And in this culture, 
being kind to the dead in the context of Ruth has lost her husband. Elimelech, uh, Naomi's husband, is now dead. The family name will be gone. How do you be kind to the dead? You raise a, a child. You have a child that will carry on the family name. Has Boaz done that yet? No. But I think what we see is a glimmer of hope in Naomi. She recognizes Boaz is the one. He's, 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 a, he's a near kin. And, and he's shown kindness to us, to, to the living. I mean, Naomi and Ruth are living. And I think she's hopeful that he'll show kindness in the family name for those who had died and, and moving forward here. And Naomi goes on to say, and Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. I do have to stop and think here, why did Naomi not say anything till now? It could be Naomi was in the throes of grief and despair so much. She she did she had shut out the outside world. Yeah, she knew who Boaz was. Yeah, she might know who this other gentleman is who comes in the story later. But she just wasn't at the point to process that. Maybe, I don't know. It could be she'd given up hope. I don't know. It was kind of a risky thing to send Ruth out to a random field. She could be abused by some of the people in the period of the judges. <coughs> But we have it coming together here that this man, he's near of kin to us and he's been gracious and kind thus far. Maybe he'll go all the way. Verses 21 to 23, Ruth goes on to say, and he said to me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended my harvest. So he's invited her, stay with us, which means this is not just barley harvest. The barley harvest is the first harvest. You have the wheat harvest coming, which is more of the premium crop. There's more bang for the buck of, of labor that you put in. It's a better product to work with. And I don't say that because I understand these. I just, I'm just respouting what several commentators have noted about the crop. So um, some of you may know more about crops than me, and I would not mind an education in that way. But Naomi's response when she hears this, how Boaz has invited her to reap the continued harvest with them, she says to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. Yeah, it might not look so good if Boaz had been gracious and kind to her and she just goes to other fields. Okay, There has been some somewhat of a relationship built here on some level. It says in verse 23, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz, to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now, one of the things I think is, is beautiful in this chapter is just how the structure works. We are introduced with Boaz. We end out with Boaz and a focus on him. Boaz blesses his workers in verses 4 to 5, and now, towards the end of the chapter, Naomi blesses Boaz for his actions. Ruth has in verses 6 to 7, expressed a desire to glean in Boaz's field. And in verses 17 to 18, Ruth has actually put that into action and been able to glean in his field. In verses 8 to 9, Boaz invited Ruth to drink and charged the young men with, with what they were not allowed to do to her and to, to watch out for her. And then we have again this meal that we talked about this morning in verses 14 to 16, where Boaz invites her to eat at this meal, this lunch, and again, he charges the young men with more information. And at that second giving is where we get the, the subtle Ruth doesn't know what's happening instructions. Okay? Again, I just love the beauty of scripture. And I'm sorry if I nerd out on this, but I hope you, you see and enjoy some of this. Ruth responded to the, um, to the, with amazement about letting her drink and get the water with the men and how Boaz had showed grace to her as a foreigner in verse 10. And in verse 13, Ruth has responded with Boaz's grace and announcement as well. And that's why I started this morning with saying this verses 11 to 12 is the center of Boaz's praise and blessing on Ruth. The Bible's beautiful in how it's put together, all right? But let me stop and pause and talk about a few things that are significant about this first encounter. One, there's a material significance to this. As this chapter closes in verses 17 to 18, she 
She has this ephah of barley. They need food to live. They need this to live. And here you have five to ten gallons worth. It's kind of interesting to me. Commentators are talking about the weight of this. And like, well, would Ruth actually be able to carry this? And whatnot? I'm like, yeah, I really think. Well, let's be honest. If she's a hardworking woman, I think she can carry two five-gallon buckets. All right? Uh, um, maybe, maybe modern people who haven't grown up in society or haven't grown up in the country, haven't done a lot of work, maybe the, those type of women couldn't carry two five-gallon buckets. But I've seen a lot of women who can carry two five-gallon buckets of water, and I have a feeling Ruth could carry two five-gallon buckets of whatever now. I don't know that she had plastic buckets. I'm sure she didn't. But we have an idea of the measurements here. Okay, But this has been an abundant material significance to this story. Here's Naomi and Ruth who have little hope of food, and look at this bounty and blessing. And the barley, again, it had a lot of husk and chaff to it. And now they have a ticket into the wheat harvest when it comes as well. So the author, I think, is, is giving us more significance here than just the food. There's also personal significance happening here. And that says Ruth is conveying to Naomi the events of the day. And Naomi is asking. Naomi has noticed how wonderful this blessing is. And I think Naomi sees the hand of God. But now it's indicated that Boaz, oh yeah, he's a family member. He's, it, the first time this word's used here of a redeemer, it's, it's the idea, next of kinmen, he's the goel, is the Hebrew term. A goel in the Old Testament was a relative who would take responsibility for the well-being of a family. So that could be in several different ways. One, it was if one of your relatives fell into a debt, a goel would be one to redeem your debt and to help pay you off your debt. A goel would be one... To redeem the land in Naomi and Ruth's situation, would Boaz step up to that position? One to redeem the land and take care of the land and to let Ruth and Naomi live off the land and to manage it for them. A Goel was also one who, if your family had someone murdered in it, the Goel was the one who would go after the murderer. And it seems odd to us because we have police. Seems odd to us, we live in a society with police, but they lived in a society where it was everybody's business to do justice and what's right. They lived in a society where, again, this doesn't work when, when people are focused on themselves. But when everybody has a focus on the, the Lord and his will and his way, when everybody's living by God's guidelines, it's everybody's business to make ju sure justice happens. So the Goel was one who would bring justice. And that's, we, it's been a long time. We talked about cities of refuge in, in Numbers and Leviticus and how those worked um, with the Goel here, the Redeemer. Also, the Goel is responsible to carry on the family name for someone who had died. Thus, we have here the hint of Naomi of like, he's been gracious to the living and the dead. Will he fulfill that part of it? Because the land part is, that has a benefit to Boaz as well. Okay, he may, he may allow Naomi and Ruth to live off the land, but he's still gleaning some of the profit of that land. But it's a whole other level to, to now carry on the family name. And, and so there's personal significance tied in here with what's happened, as well as there's an economic significance here. Again, the barley harvest was early, the wheat would be later. And this is much more than we have a quantity of food. We now have hope of the future that our needs will be provided. And so Boaz has not just given permission to work now, but on into the future. The ticket to the wheat fields is open. And Ruth and Naomi now have security that if they have many more days with this type of abundance, they will have food to get them on through the winter until their land can be theirs once more. Until they can once again take claim of their land and they can work it and, and they may not, they may not have enough to get started either, but they have enough here. They have hope of God providing through Boaz for them. And I want to take note here, we, we talked about this back when we covered verses 1 to 12. When Boaz is given credit for being the blessing and being the one to be gracious, Boaz refers that credit to the Lord. Even though Boaz is the hands through which God is using Ruth and Naomi to get blessed, He's crediting it back to the Lord. He's given the Lord the glory for this. And so 
As we close out and think about a few things here with this passage, one, I want you to think Ruth remained humble when Boaz was praising her. Do you or I remain humble when others give us credit? You see, the, the problem we often find is in the heat of a situation, when it's been a rough day, when your knuckles are bloody because you, you hit a few things a few times, and yes, you were doing a good deed, but it sure just, you were sweaty, you were hot, you didn't enjoy it, and when someone gives you credit, are you quick to pat yourself on the back? Ruth was humble. We also saw previously Boaz was humble. And it should be a good reminder to us that we, in whatever situation, whatever way we've sought to be a blessing or let the Lord use us, we should stay humble and give the Lord the credit. Also, your Boaz continues to show grace. He's showed grace multiple times all over. He's dripped with grace. He's been very gracious and kind. But now he's doing showing grace in hidden ways. Do you or I find secret ways to bless people? This is where life can be a little fun, all right? Because sometimes we don't want to bless people in ways that we know because we don't want to change the relationship. We don't want them to feel indebted to us. We don't want them to uh, maybe uh, feel like they owe us something or whatever. So sometimes we'll give or we'll do something in ways that are surprising and they can be kind of fun. A couple ways um, I've, I've enjoyed this because you get to sit back and you get to watch. Almost like you're playing a joke on somebody. When I was in college, um, I was towards the last year, year or so of college, and there's a friend of mine who I doubt it he'll listen to the sermon, so I should be good here. Um, but he was married, and his they were struggling financially, and I knew they were struggling financially. Now I'm a college student; I didn't have a lot of money, but I I just felt led in the Lord. I need to do something for him, but I knew I knew he wouldn't take it from me. You know what I'm saying? You have a relationship where you know he's not going to take the money from you. So I decided, I knew he left his car unlocked an awful lot. And so I snuck in and I put, I don't know if it was a 50 or $100 bill, it doesn't really matter. But I stuck it in, in as much as I could, like around the key part of the car so he couldn't get the key in without finding that bill. You know, you're a little concerned that you don't want it to fall on the floor and fall out, because then you just threw away money. But you don't want it, you know, you don't want to hide it, so it takes him 20 years to find it anyway, or he sells the car and someone else finds it. So I got it there, and I remember it was kind of neat because he came to me within a week. He's like, you don't believe what happened. And I didn't know what he was talking about yet. He's like, yeah, I've never had this happen before. I've heard stories of this happening, but somebody snuck a bill into my car. And I'm listening to it, and I, I know the other side of the story. It's fun do that. It's enjoyable. It's, it's, it's delightful to be able to do that. Now, I didn't tell him. If he listens to the sermon, he'll probably figure it out, but I doubt it he will, so I think we're good to go. But that type of, of showing grace in secret ways can be fun. It can be a blessing. It can be exhilarating because you get to see yourself minister to other people. Now, I use that as an illustration. There's been other things that have happened. Sometimes, um, even here at church, I've had people who I don't know that are even believers. Um, one gentleman came to me last year and said, look, I've got all this COVID money that I don't need. So he gave me $500 cash to use to help people you know, around here. So part of that went to help some other people. The rest of it was put in our benevolence fund. He just wanted an anonymous blessing to happen. How can you be a blessing to people? Now, I want you to think back to the ways that I mentioned already. Sometimes it can be a material blessing in ways so you can show grace. Maybe it's a special item you can make or give to somebody, or a special meal that would be meaningful, something encouraging to somebody, something that fits a need they don't have. Uh, we had a, a gentleman where uh, I was assistant pastor in Illinois. He was older, he was retired, he had... Um, he had been married two or three times, and his wife had, had uh, died, and it was he was kind of lonely. He was the type of gentleman who, he loved to be around people, he loved to do things for the church. He became so comfortable at our house, he would walk in and open the fridge, and that wasn't a problem. He'd open it up and say, what do you have to eat? Well, there was a need in his life. Now, on the flip side, he was also the same type of gentleman who, it seemed like every other Sunday, he was taking my wife and I out to eat and paying for everything, and, you know, if if we were going to have ice cream and we didn't have the right thing in the house, he was the first to go buy it. That 
He had money, but he didn't have people. And he needed that. And it was good to provide and be that. Uh, and sometimes in hidden ways. But think also about personally. Sometimes it's incredibly meaningful to spend time with people. Maybe they're going through a rough patch. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe they've just had a lot of things happen and they don't need a lecture. They don't need a sermon. They don't need money. They just need you. And there's a way that maybe you can be a blessing to them. Again, this passage has been, well, as is, is every way possible, whether it's moistening the bread that she brought, whether it's for giving her, uh, or giving her an opportunity to drink out of the water, or whether it's, here's a handful on purpose, we're sneaking, uh, not under the rug, but you, you know, here, we're dropping things on purpose. How can you be a blessing like that to the people around you? And lastly, it could be economically, or, you know, we're, maybe you secretly pay for someone's bill, bill at a restaurant, or you help out with a utility bill, or, or whatever it is. And I want to also note here that Ruth and Naomi, when they responded, when they had this discussion once they get home about Boaz, it's not suspicious. They're not sitting there, I wonder what his angle is. I wonder what's going on. When people are kind to you, do you instantly become suspicious of their motives? Now, I want to say that there's a time for that, all right? What do you think a slick car salesman's going to do? They're going to tell you everything you want to hear. They're going to tell you, so I understand the suspicion. But sometimes we overread situations. We overthink the situation. And we attribute motives to people that may not be there. They may be trying to do the best thing, and they may try to be honest and, and, and friendly. Um, I recently had a situation um, down in Wheatland. I was getting coffee, and a young lady came, came up to me and said, Hi, my name's so-and-so. What's your name? And I was almost taken back because it was so, not aggressive, but just bold. Yeah, there's a good word for it. And I was thinking, I was very polite, very cordial, very nice, and I was like, okay, what? Come to find out she's a little different of a lady, and maybe not, not all be there mentally. And so what's the best response I can have? Be gracious. Be kind. Now, some of those situations could mean I need to put my antennas up and be thinking, do I need to be careful? Okay? But that graciousness and kindness in a situation, sometimes we can get so concerned about protecting ourselves. We're worried about losing out on something, whether it's money or time or, or whatever, that we become so suspicious of everybody. And we're not gracious to receive grace. Sometimes in our life, we're on the giving end of grace. But we need to give. We need to be the one that God uses to give. Sometimes we'll be on the receiving ends of grace. And that may be in different ways. We need to be gracious in how we receive. I learned a lesson early on in ministry. There are, there are those who always have their hands out for money. We call them mooches. Okay? Those people don't understand grace because they're always trying to get everybody to give. But there's other people in life who... On the other end of the perspective, God has blessed them, and they're not willing to receive. They hold their hands back. They're always the one to pay the ticket at dinner. They're always the one that wants to do this or that. They always want to be the giver, and know there's times you need to be gracious to receive. And sometimes what happens is the way person A is giving grace is the way person B needs grace. But the way person B needs grace or gives grace, is the way person A needs grace. Just as Boaz and Ruth here dealt graciously one with another, both living out how God has been gracious with us as his people, may we be people who are gracious to all those around us. And let me encourage you specifically this week, find a way to be sneaky with grace. Find something fun to bestow grace and be good to somebody in your life where you can be a blessing to them. It could be a note slipped in their car. It could be doing something for them. Be, be sneaky with grace in a good way. And see if you can be a blessing to those around you. Lord, we thank you for this text of scripture and how we're seeing Ruth and Boaz, both who seem to be individuals, 
who have a godly character, but as they have shown graciousness one to another. Lord, may we be reminded how gracious you are to us and how you daily load us with benefits. Lord, we ask that you make us a people of grace, a people that it's a delight for others to be around. Not that we never speak truth, and not that we never cross in our ideas and, 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 and ideals with others, but that we're so gracious and kind that when, when we share your word of truth, and sometimes it hurts, those who hear it know that we have their best in mind and that we're sharing it out of love and compassion. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as the piano begins to play, let me ask you, are you a gracious person? Are you gracious only with certain people? Or are you like Boaz where you're gracious with even the outsiders? What's a way that you can leave a handful on purpose secretly for someone you know? Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into what you can do today or this week to give someone a handful on purpose. <laughs>